Hey guys, Solomon Salmon here, bringing you this overview of E3, one of the biggest gaming events in the year, running for one week in, I believe, Los Angeles this year. Sunny Los Angeles, and what a great place it must have been. I'm joined in this overview by Slippers, who has his own gaming channel. You've probably seen it. It's, you know, it's a great channel, great content. I've been in a few of his Dawn of War videos, uh, acting very ineptly, whilst he prattles on about some beautiful skills and tactics. Uh, Slippers, say hi to the viewers. Uh, what is your channel about? Give themselves a little introduction. Okay, well, my channel is, as you would expect, covering Dawn of War, a gaming-focused channel, mostly covering PC games and whatever real, um, whatever real titles kind of spark my interest. At the moment, it's a bit of StarCraft 2, it's a bit of RTS focus, real-time strategy, and in future, I will be moving on to Really, whatever games look cool and fun to do videos on. Nice. Well, I, I'm pretty sure people are going to be coming back to those videos because uh, we're all gamers and we all like nice, interesting, shiny things. But uh, we Indeed. we are gamers. We we know you know we follow gaming a lot, so we have been following E3. So we're just going to kind of be going through a list of what we've picked out as being the biggest kind of announcements, hits of E3. Uh, Long list, long list. It was pretty good E3. A couple of boring conferences, I would say, but on the whole, a good E3. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to kind of give our pick of E3, what we personally think was the biggest mention or announcement. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if we've got the same one, I think. I'm not sure we will. Um, I think I've got an idea of what yeah. this is going to say, but should be interesting. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let's get started with the, the first conference, the EA conference. So I think that the first big kind of announcement of E3 uh, was in the EA conference. It was Star Wars Battlefront 2. Now I have I've quite extensively played the first game, uh, and I was one of those players that thought it was a bit of a disappointment that it promised a lot, but maybe didn't deliver on that. Uh, I know that Slippers, you've played uh, a little bit with me, kind of just casually, so you you know a little bit about it. Yeah. Uh, and you're I, I take it you're a Star Wars fan. I should know if you're a Star Wars fan, shouldn't I? Yeah, yeah, you, you probably should, good friend of mine. Yes. But, uh, yeah, um, I would definitely consider myself a Star Wars fan. Not absolutely nuts Star Wars fan. Like, I do believe you've read a bunch of the, the fan fiction around it. Um, not only the fan fiction, fiction so the, much, the, the extended universe. The extended universe. I've read most of the extended That's universe. That's what you've read. Devastated when they kind of made it yeah. non-canon. But um, yeah, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So I've read a couple. They're good, yeah. they're good. Um, so yeah, as I'm, a, I'm a mediocre fan. <laughs> as a Star Wars fan, obviously I'm really excited whenever they announce a Star Wars game. Battlefront 2, oh yes, am I excited for Battlefront 2. I think it changes most of the flaws they kind of had. The biggest flaw they had with Battlefront, in my opinion, was the lack of a single player campaign. That almost sounds counterintuitive when you've got things like Call of Duty, which essentially is a multiplayer game with a single player campaign tacked on at the end and that's kind of the way a lot of games are going but with Star Wars Battlefront you go back to the original kind of Star Wars Battlefront 2 the the PS2 version that had a great single player campaign not not kind of in depth of story wise but just gameplay wise it was a brilliant single player campaign so I'm hoping they're going to do that again with this version uh, it certainly looks like they've gone full on plot looks really nice which is a second point the graphics are incredible. You must have seen. You must have seen the trailers, John. Uh, think back to. Uh, yeah, they've been showing a lot off about the Thebes map. Now, think back to Star Wars: The Phantom Menace, the film. I would say that the graphics in Star Wars: Battlefront 2 for Thebes are better than they were back in the film. I mean, I think that shows how far we've kind of come with graphics. That you can say a video game now has better graphics than a movie. I, I definitely would agree. It looks gorgeous. The first game, if I'm not terribly, utterly mistaken, was the Frostbite engine. Yeah. Yeah, so the Frostbite engine, uh, pioneered by DICE, who did um, Bad Company 2, kind of onwards Battlefield stuff. Uh, it's such a gorgeous en engine in terms of lighting. I mean, if you watch the trailer footage for Battlefront 2, you can really tell all of the, the gameplay segments. It looks so pretty, and... The first game was definitely a looker, um, mm, definitely. particularly the DLC map that was the forest, I believe. I don't know what that was exactly called, but it, you know, even just looking at yeah. still screenshot images of gameplay, you could tell it was just such a pretty game. Mm. And yeah, 
I'm definitely excited that Battlefront 2 is staying on top of being a, you know, just a graphical beast in that sense. Yeah, they're definitely staying on that. It's, uh, it's something they're definitely plugging with the Battlefront series as a whole. Um, the only other kind of major point I got from the announcement was that they've finally gotten rid of the tokens gameplay where essentially if you want to be a hero, you want to be a starfighter, you have to run and pick up a token. Which oh, I was so annoying. Just so like yeah. you, you would have games where you just wouldn't have an opportunity to do either because you were just spawning in the wrong place, etc. Now they've moved back onto the I think it's battle points. I'd need to check that. Uh, but it's a much better system where you playing the objectives, getting kills means that you are rewarded with uh, being a hero or a starfighter, etc. So if you're a really good player, you'll unlock a hero earlier. But I think they've done it in such a way that towards the very, very end of the game, most players will have accrued enough battle points to be a hero. They might just have to queue up for it sort of thing. So it, re it rewards good play, but it still allows everyone to take part. Yeah, I, I definitely personally, personally love this um, idea that they're removing what was essentially a random system of you know, one person could get lucky and run into the best token on the map, mm. and another person could get unlucky and run into like a pretty poor one in comparison. And yes, yeah, swapping it with a system that's just more rewarding to the good players, it's going to make it more, more interesting long term, and maybe interesting enough to competitive types, so that maybe an esports scene grows around it. I mean. It doesn't have to. It's probably going to be a super fun game without that. But uh, yeah, this mechanically seems a lot more interesting at, at a first glance, for me at least. Um, and I, I think for most people that will be the case. Definitely. And I would actually like to go back into your, your first point. Okay. That they're adding a single player campaign as that is such a cool thing. Like, I think you mentioned, but the story doesn't have to be great. It doesn't have to be a mind, you know, blow in terms of how it's written, um, or, or particularly how it's choreographed. But just having a single-player Star Wars experience, mm. I think for many people, will be enough of a reason to pick up this game. And that's definitely a ball that they dropped with the first Battlefront, it missing that completely. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, um, for me, this. This looks awesome. Yeah, I mean, going back to the original Star Wars Battlefront 2, the PS2 version, I mean, the campaign, as I said, wasn't brilliant. It was mostly the multiplayer maps, and then you would have to go to a certain place and hold it, or they'd add in some slight new mechanics, like uh, Wampers would suddenly attack you out of nowhere and you'd have to kill them all. But it was, <laughs> it was fun, and that's the important thing. It wasn't overly complicated, it was fun. Yeah. And, I mean, there was also Galactic Conquest, which was... Uh, I would almost call it a kind of risk slash video game. So it was essentially you kind of maneuvering forces around a map to fulfill an objective, take planets uh, A, B, C sort of thing, or just conquer everything. But then you'd play almost multiplayer ma matches, uh, well, single player, but in the multiplayer format matches to take objectives within that kind of single player, almost personal campaign in the conquest. Which I think was really popular with fans, and I think that that was a huge thing missing from the Star Wars Battlefront. Yeah, so I think we both agree then. Uh, Battlefront Two is definitely heading in the right direction from what we've seen. Yeah, it should. It's pretty awesome. It's going to be one of uh, a huge game, and it came so early in E3 as well, which is uh, brilliant because it's uh, it's meant that whilst the conference is going on, people can talk about it. So another big game they announced was FIFA 18. Um, now, obviously, it's another FIFA. It's not a case of it's going to be a, 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 a franchise-changing game or anything like that. It's going to be pretty much the same old, same old FIFA. But, you know, upgraded graphics, new squads, uh, and the return of the journey, which actually surprised me. So, I mean, you can always guarantee that FIFA's going to sell hundreds of millions of copies because it's FIFA. It's, it's just a huge game because of the title, essentially. But, um, you know, if, if you're a fan of FIFA, I think that there's a lot to be excited about. They've improved the penalty-taking system, they've changed crossing, um, you know, as I said, improved graphics, always nice. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's not the most exciting announcement, but it's one we I think you need to talk about. Um, but then the journey was mostly the surprising thing. I thought they'd ditch it after FIFA 17. I have to say, I thought they wouldn't include that. 
it was that was the most kind of brand groundbreaking thing of FIFA 17, the fact that there was almost a single-player campaign in it where you took a character. The fact that it's coming back should be interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing what they've done with it, kind of developing Alex Hunter's story. Um, yeah, should be a pretty standard but good game. I don't play the games much, but from what I hear, I'm definitely glad that they're pushing kind of new stuff, new ideas, um, new, new kind of just ways to tell a story within what's essentially a fairly typical sports game so yeah sounds good okay so one game that i think we can both quite confidently say um that we're definitely looking forward to is bioware's anthem so this is sort of an emerging genre where if you taken a look at the slow release schedule of destiny um within the last couple of years you might have a good idea of what Anthem sort of is going to entail. It's sort of an exploration looting um, looting style game where as you progress through what's essentially an open world, you will make encounters, defeat encounters, defeat bosses in the world, collect loot from said bosses and said encounters. And it's a very RPG-like system of steadily improving your character with new weapons, um, in this case, it's a sci-fi universe, so similar to Destiny, you'll be finding new guns, um, new ways to get around the place quicker and in a cooler way. And even though I have not played the original Destiny, um, it definitely looked like a really cool... You can tell that people were hyped about how it was structured. Um, even though it kind of fell a little flat on its face uh, immediately on launch because of its sort of threadbare kind of status on launch, um, they've definitely added a lot of stuff to it, and so if Anthem does a better launch than Destiny did, bearing in mind, of course, that Destiny 2 is definitely due to come out soon as well, I, I do believe Anthem has a very real place in terms of relevancy coming up. Um, so what are your thoughts, Salmon? Well, I, uh, you mentioned that you haven't played Destiny that much. I, I have played Destiny quite a lot. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm that into it. Um, I uh, I kind of borrowed it from my brother-in-law. I had it for a few weeks. I'd say it's a game that I thought I would really enjoy, but ended up not so much. But having watched the kind of the trailers for Anthem, kind of read a bit about it, it seems very similar, as you say, in terms of the exploration, looting. But ah, it just Anthem kind of gauges my attention a lot more for some reason. I I think it's more the fact that. It's based kind of around a more open world, if you will, rather than linear levels yeah. that you head out from from a certain point. It's kind of you have this home base and then you jump in your suit and then fly away, which I have to say really got me when I was watching uh, E3. That footage of the characters just jumping off a cliff and then suddenly flying around the open world. Wow. Yeah. That was just so cool. There were goosebumps. It was just, it was just oh, it was such a cool thing. Yeah. It, it's the idea of Wanderlust, I think, where yes. you literally have the ability to very easily and mobilely just um traverse a gorgeous, you know, just a very graphically impressive landscape and more or less do what you want within the limits of your character and that's you know, that's really cool. And, by the way, since we're on this point, graphically it looks spectacular. Oh, yes. Which, for a game of this scope, mm. is quite impressive. I mean, we were talking about Battlefront 2 being beautiful, and that's a lot easier to accomplish, if you will, because it's based around smaller scale maps. This is an open world that looks gorgeous, and it really does push... I mean, yeah. they, they initially showed it off uh, during the uh, Xbox, the Microsoft conference, and we'll come on to Microsoft a little in a, just a minute, but I think that this really pushes Microsoft's kind of focus on 4K graphics. They're the ones kind of really pushing that their, that their consoles are going to be 4K beautiful, and this game they showed off during that kind of uh, speech sort of thing, and it really hammered home just how good it's going to be, 4K graphics. Because I'm, I'm watching the trailer yeah. now, and it, it is gorgeous. Like, I'm, I've just seen an explosion, and I'm like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's one of the games where it's such a cool uh, premise. And I think we've got to do shout-outs as well to the environment that they've opted for. Mm. Um, unlike Destiny, which, from my understanding, is quite 
sort of barren sci-fi style. Um, you know, you're on a fairly unpopularized, unpopulated, I should say, um, you know, planet, which doesn't which yeah. doesn't have the same level of um, you know wildlife as apparently Anthem has. It looks very lush. You've got mm. essentially like a tropical rainforest style they've gone for with like grand massive scale uh kind of arches from maybe some long lost civilization i mean we don't know the story really but it looks you know the setting looks fantastic and i'm yeah i think we're both quite excited for this yeah destiny focuses on a lot more of a kind of dystopian ruins apocalypse uh, post-apocalyptic world whilst anthem is a lot more of a kind of yeah yes it follows that post-apocalypse uh, kind of survival theme, if you will, um, with like a small enclave of humans and then you're setting out to protect them sort of thing. It's a lot more, as you say, the environment is more alive. There's lots more animals roaming around. There's yes. such luscious plant life. And then they've got these giant storms where things happen and the environment completely changes. It's That's so cool. Mm, it's like you're setting out into a living world. Yeah. Yeah, it does mean a lot. It's um, it's similar to like why everyone loved Skyrim as a game. You could wander the wilderness in Skyrim, and you know, just watch animals go by. It would feel like a living, breathing world. And this looks very similar to that. Um, um yeah, I, I that plus the genre, it being quite a new genre in terms of there haven't really been that many games in it. Just Destiny, really. Um, so the setting genre, it's all kind of definitely in the foot of Anthem. And the fact that Destiny didn't do too well on its launch first time around, hopefully that's some pointers to Bioware as to how to run this. And yeah, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, Very cool stuff, I mean, even. Destiny, I mean, Destiny is now huge. It's really big. I mean, they're bringing out Destiny 2, which they showed a little bit off, which we'll talk about a little later in the Sony conference. But I mean, they're clearly setting yeah. Anthem up to be the kind of the Microsoft competitor to the PlayStation 4's Destiny. They're they're kind of it's going to be a kind of Anthem versus Destiny franchise-wise, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Which is actually quite exciting, as even though um, we primarily PC gamers, um, the fact that it's, this is going to be coming to PC and the original Destiny never did. That's also definitely a factor, you know, putting it ahead of Destiny mm. in the in its, I guess, the hearts and minds of PC gamers. So maybe that gives it a bit of an edge. Who knows? So I think going into E3, probably the biggest announcement everyone was expecting, because it was leaked so heavily, was Project Scorpio for Air for Microsoft for Xbox. Um, it was unveiled almost immediately in the Microsoft conference as the Xbox One X, their new big console, the latest version of the Xbox One. Honestly, I don't know why they didn't just keep Project Scorpio because that is a far better name. The Xbox Scorpio is a far better name <laughs> than the Xbox One X, I'm just saying. But it's a little stupid. Yeah, I know, yeah. but uh, the console itself sounds beautiful. Uh, I don't think we need to go through all the hardware details. Other people have done that far more knowledgeably really. than we have. Let's just say that it does look incredible hardware-wise. Uh, but the yeah. the thing for me was the price. $500. That is not cheap. Yeah, although to be fair, it's not also too far off. Um, the more recent kind of high-powered consoles as well, you know. The, what was it, the PlayStation Pro? That was pretty expensive. Mm. Did you ever see how much it cost on launch? I don't think I have the full figures. Uh, I can't remember off but, the top of my um, head. Yeah, but consoles have been getting more and more expensive. Mm. And the gap between a high-end console, you know, the latest generation of console, and a, you know, a low to mid-end PC, it's closing. And it's going to be interesting to see how, uh, how consoles and PCs kind of adapt to that. Yeah, but, um, I mean, PC's still yeah. currently ahead of consoles, and I think probably forever will. Hashtag PC Master Race. Um, yeah, but, just because you can customise them to such a great extent. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I think that it shows that consoles are becoming a real force, hardware-wise. Um, 
what I would want to point out is the fact that if you look back to when they kind of announced Project Scorpio, the lead designers, they came out and they were saying, oh, it's going to have 4K graphics. It's going to be, you know, graphically beautiful. And it's going to work excellently with VR. Now, roll on 2017, roll on E3, all mention of VR is gone. And all they're talking about is 4K. And I think that shows that Microsoft's strategy Ooh. now is to abandon VR and focus on the traditional console gaming experience of you hold a controller, you look at a TV. Whereas... PlayStation, their conference was dominated by VR. They were really pushing the PlayStation VR as the new big thing. So I think it shows that there is a divergence in where Microsoft and PlayStation are going. Um, not just in basic console hardware. It is now almost changing in the direction of the consoles themselves. Which is just great for consumers because it gives you the better kind of choice. One console does one thing better than the other, and the other does something better than the other, if you know what I mean. Exactly. That's a terrible way to say it, but... Uh, it really was. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, better choice for consumers. Which, I, it can, which, which is good. You yeah, know, it good. can only be a good thing. Another of the big games that Microsoft was certainly talking about was Sea of Thieves. Now, Sea of Thieves was announced not this year, but last year at E3 2016, but... 2017 is where we're finally kind of getting to see the game itself. A lot more about the mechanics, the gameplay, the, the in-game story sort of thing. I really like the idea of Sea of Thieves because, you know, it's PvP pirates. Who doesn't want to be a pirate? Who doesn't want to kill other people who are pretending to be pirates? But at the same time, it doesn't take itself too seriously. I mean, the graphics are kind of there, set in an amusing manner, albeit slightly realistic sort of thing. It's not a straight-up they're supposed to look like people. It's a, uh, look at our silly pirates, which is fun. It's uh, a very caricature kind of style of um, mm, that's design, it. Yeah, exactly. call it. Like, everyone's, yeah, it's sort of slightly exaggerated, but not to the point where it's, you know, kind of Minecraft blocky style. It's, But it's it looks, like you say, graphically, I really dig the art style, um, and it's detailed enough so that it's not just a, just a, a kind of, graphical style where there's nothing pretty to look at such as say minecraft but it actually looks nice in its own graphical style um yeah and of course like you say who doesn't want to play pirates in a pvp setting right that's so cool obviously one of the big things they pushed with sea of thieves was microsoft's streaming software mixer which sea of thieves was uh i, I wouldn't it, it was kind of instrumental in pushing ahead and kind of molding into how it would work because Mixer is designed to allow lots of people to stream at the same time together, making it easier for people like us, gay, uh, gaming enthusiasts on YouTube uh, and people who take it far more seriously like IGN and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a game that I personally don't think will last. I don't think it has legs. I think it'll be uh, a game that a lot of people buy, enjoy for a few months and then kind of put down and don't come back to. But I think it's a game that will have a legacy in how it's pushed uh, pushed forward gaming broadcasting. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you say that because it's. I want to say that it's a pessimistic viewpoint, but it, I don't think it is. I think you're actually very on point. I think it's um, it's gonna have it, it's in the spotlight, and it will be a very nice spot. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, it it launches very well in a nice condition, not too buggy, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Um, but eventually, I, th I think it will definitely decline. But it's it's such a cool premise from the ground up, up that uh, I can't help but hope that it has just a few more extra months than what I think it will end up having. You know, I mean, in, it, in the spotlight. If the devs can introduce a lot of good features, kind of roll them out as the game is developing in the community, maybe it has got legs. Maybe it will survive. Uh, I, as you say, I'm a bit of a pessimist about it. I. I hope it survives, because it looks a lot of fun, but I just feel like people will get distracted by something else a few months down the line. A game, obviously, they've been talking about for a while now. There's been a few trailers out, uh, and it's a game that the announcement was notable for a particular reason, and I will get onto that reason in a second, but I don't want it to dominate us talking. Um, this game is Middle-Earth Shadow of War. I've played, I've played the first one, Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I put a video up 
a couple of months ago about my favorite fantasy games, Shadow of Mordor was on it because of the way it kind of... It was... A, a, a Lord of the Rings game on a grand scale, but at the same time it felt very small in scale when you were creeping up behind an orc and stabbing him in the back sort of thing. Uh, and yeah, so the grand scale, mm. you wouldn't say the grand scale got in the way of the combat. The combat still felt punchy and exactly. as it wanted to. It felt like a, yeah. a really huge open world that you were taking on small scale combat within. And it was a perfect kind of mix of that. It's really good to see Talion and Celebrimbor back, uh, even though Celebrimbor has one of the least pronounceable names in video games. <laughs> so easy to get wrong. Um, but it's really good to see that they've ramped up the level of combat. You know, it, Shadow of Mordor was incredible because of how intimate it felt. You know, sneaking around stealth-wise, taking out orcs. And now in Shadow of War, they've ramped that up to large-scale stronghold battles. Yeah, I saw footage of the stronghold battles. It, it looks so cool. <laughs> Part, partly is because I'm a huge Tolkien um, fanboy, but partly because, it, yeah, the gameplay looks awesome. Um, I mean, the gameplay in the first game was very... Uh, I don't want to describe it this way, but it was very Batman Arkham, Arkham Knight style, where essentially there's combos and there's a rhythm to combat, and if you get disrupted, you start doing less damage, and your combo breaks, and... Yeah, so... Um, do you have any more details on this new on this new feature? Ah, uh, well, the the, the the kind of the big thing that you otherwise have to mention, and it was so noticeable during the kind of the the latest story and gameplay trailers, is the super Australian orc slash troll. Uh, I'm not sure what he was. But <laughs> he was so Australian. I, I don't know. I feel like he's just a big orc. I feel like that's what it is. I mean, I didn't have a I problem with it. That. I thought I thought it was amazing, but it was just a bit <laughs> like what? <laughs> but you know, it shakes. It shows. I mean, I guess he's got to have an accent. Yeah, but... it shows great orc diversity. Orcs come from everywhere, not just from that one place with really gravelly evil voices. So another game that we picked out was uh, the Darwin Project, which. I would describe as Overwatch meets Hunger Games. It's got that kind of Overwatch graphical style. Um, the menus and the color scheme in particular, I thought were very... You could just lift them straight out of Overwatch sort of thing. Um, and then it's got that Hunger Games, you know, everyone trying to kill everyone else, trying to survive sort of thing, which I think you, you in particular were quite interested in. Yeah, it's mostly because... Um, this feels like such a powerful genre. I mean, I think the first one that or the first thing that sprouted this whole genre was Daisy, which was too familiar. It was you know zombies roaming a world, and then this play this play this setting where people would kind of fight each other and kill each other for their food and ammo and medic medical supplies, and from there we went into I think it was King of the Hill on PC and there we've got Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. I do believe Player Unknown was like one of the big the original creators of one of those previous titles. Um I think it was King of the Hill. But yeah it's this really cool emerging genre. It's something we don't see too often where just a new way of playing games just emerges very spontaneously um and organically and yeah it's a really cool genre from what I've seen. Um I think our main experience with the genre was playing a modded server, multiplayer server in Minecraft, mm. where it was set is essentially just Hunger Games uh, in Minecraft, and you would go around a map, try and find all the diamond armor and weapons. If you could, if you couldn't, you were, you know you'd probably die. Yeah. But um, it's super fun. It's pitting one player against another. You know, survival of the fittest, that kind of theme. Um, there's a little to keep. To keep every game fresh, you know, you're not too sure what weapons you're going to find or supplies. But yeah, it's a really good genre, and I think we're both planning on sort of transitioning and testing one of the recent titles out, I, I believe, at least. Yeah, it's definitely something I want to look at. I, I think it's the Hunger Games style game, shall we call it, I think it has a lot of traction because yeah. it really does engage 
competitiveness, which is so innate in gaming that it is literally... Yeah. I mean, you think about Call of Duty. It's your team versus the enemy. You're trying to beat them. This is literally a free-for-all, free, uh, free for all, you against everyone else survival. It's not just who has the best class. It's who gets to the weapons first. Who gets lucky and finds this safe area that they can kind of camp out and heal up and then get back into it. There's so much tactic involved in it, so much competition involved in it, that I think this is going to be a growing genre, as you say, and I think it's going to be a really good one. So definitely something I want to look into, uh, and as you say, definitely something you want to get into. So if there's one game that literally won't die, it is Skyrim. <laughs> it literally will not die. The game came out in November 2011. Oh, dear. Since then, we have had uh, ports onto pretty much every console. We have had Skyrim Special Edition, where they've just remastered the graphics. And now Bethesda... A prolific modding scene. Yes. I Can't forget that. Prolific modding scene that has literally kept the game alive. And now we have got Skyrim on the Nintendo Switch. So Nintendo's big console, one of the biggest games ever. It makes sense. Get it onto it. Ah, oh, man. It's been six years, guys. I mean, yeah. could you... I mean, as cool as it is, as cool as it is, oh, I mean, if you watch the trailer for the Switch Skyrim version, um, obviously, they're going for the obvious selling points. You can literally pretend to shoot a bow with your hand motions. Yep. Clearly, that's really cool, mm -hmm. and lots of people want to do that, but I think we, we're both in the mindset that we just want them to make a new game for the Switch, and yeah. obviously... Um, Bethesda make a new game themselves. As good as Skyrim was, it's time. It's time to move been. on. The Elder Scrolls Six needs Please. to arrive. Like there were a lot of rumors going into E3 oh. that Bethesda were going to announce Elder Scrolls Six, or and there were a hell of a lot of rumors about this a new a new franchise based around space exploration. That didn't happen. And I personally think that Bethesda had a very Ooh. quiet E3, and this. I mean, they had a couple of big announcements we're going to talk about those in a second but Skyrim on Switch was one of the biggest and that I think must be seen as a disappointment for them because is it really that big a deal I mean as I said the game's been out six years yeah it's been on every other thing are that many people gonna buy it I mean I've I've got it for PlayStation which is what I played on it originally I have it also on my PC because I, I bought all the expansion packs and the game special offer so I'm not inclined to then buy it for the Switch. I'm just going to play it probably on PC now because of the incredible modding scene. I just... Yeah, like, I personally... It feels like a really lazy scene, decision. Yeah, yeah, like, um, even using a whole bunch of mods, and I have done this fairly recently, within the last six months, I've made extensively modded, super customized version of a PC Skyrim. And I had fun for a couple of weeks, but I'd already played the game, and even with all the odds, even with it looking super crisp, or just graphically, the gameplay being enhanced, I very quickly got bored of it, surprisingly quickly, because it was essentially, at its roots, at its core, in-game. And that is what this is. Yeah, and that's definitely, yeah. I mean, that's something Bethesda's going to have to look at going forward. Like, they can't, at 2018 E3, just go, oh, guess what? We've got another Skyrim! Because oh my God, people would... will get bored. <laughs> I mean, this year round, they've announced that you can have Lynx gear in the, in the Switch Skyrim. But the thing is, there are already mods that do that. And <laughs> I mean, literally, I, there are mods. <laughs> it literally already exists. That's not a big selling point, Bethesda. And also, it looks kind of terrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. It does. It doesn't work. Yeah. So, I mean, Bethesda have got good games. So, oh, I did have good announcements. So, let's stop um, raining on their Beating parade on <laughs> and yeah. talk about those instead. <laughs> One of the biggest games that, of course, they announced was Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus, the latest in the long running uh, Wolfenstein series. I mean, we talk about the fact that Skyrim is six years old. The original Castle Wolfenstein came out in 1981. That's that's what 30, Blimey, really? 36 years ago. That's 
you know, that's it, insane. It shows the impact and influence that this series of games has had, and I mean, you can tell why. The game is literally, oh hey, look, Nazis. Let's go shoot them all really graphically. That's a very satisfying thing to do for many people. Right. So yeah, from my understanding, um, Wolfenstein is the recent reboot has been a lot about just making super modern, high octane shooter thrills. And um, yeah, it this game looks to be just more of that. They didn't show much gameplay in the revealed trailer from the E3, but regardless, I think a lot of people who are into the series from the old games and also the series from the previous game, which probably brought a lot of new fans to its to its uh, I don't know to its fan club. I guess I'll call it. Yeah, it, it's going to be a pretty big deal for all those guys. So yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, and another game from the Bethesda conference that not as in specifically, but some weirdos out there might be interested in. The Evil Within 2, the sequel to the fairly recent Evil Within 1, which is a bit of a return to form for, I guess I would call it the triple A survival horror genre, where um, essentially you get to pay a developer to let them scare the pants off you and give you nightmares for a couple of weeks and mm. get no sleep. So if that sounds like your idea of a good time, um, The Evil Within 2 is there, coming up to be excited about. Um, personally, I like to get a good night's rest, but maybe <laughs> you're into that. Yeah, so, I mean, I've, this is your time. I've played The Evil Within 1, and it is a very scary game. It is one of the scariest games I've ever played. Um... I thought the game's story and characters weren't great, so hopefully Evil Within 2 will improve on that. I don't know if I'll get around to playing it, it's not really my genre, but yeah, if if you're into survival horror, this should be quite a big one for you. Speaking of horror, uh, less genre like The Evil Within, more, oh Bethesda, what have you done? We have We have to talk about... Fallout 4 VR and Doom VR because they they are in our opinion differing in success shall we say because I mean I'm I'm looking at the E3 trailer for Fallout 4 VR right now and all I can think is oh Bethesda what have you done it oh it, I think we're thinking this because the gameplay does not <laughs> no. look good um, ah. And to be fair, we're not playing it. Um, maybe the person who played this for the recording used in the trailer, maybe they had a whale yeah. of a time. But to me, having played Fallout 4, you know, standard edition, it just looks like a worse version really of does. Fallout 4. It looks 4. so haphazard and awkward. And yeah, I mean... It, Fallout is just not designed for VR, let's be honest. Uh, I, I, uh, We mentioned it earlier, talking a little bit about where Microsoft and PlayStation are going. I personally don't think VR is that good. I think that it's something that will be good, but right now, it's VR only really works if you don't move. If you if you just sit at a chair and you're waving your arms yeah. like, oh, that's one thing that Star Wars Battlefront did really well, actually. They had a VR experience, and it was you flying an X-Wing. So you, you know, moved around, pressed the buttons within the cockpit, but you stayed in the cockpit. You didn't wander around, try to yeah. base build, try to shoot a death claw with a, a chain gun or anything like that. Uh, there are also quite a lot of VR games where essentially it's just a wave-based, um, you know, survival game where you sit mm. behind a wall, you don't move, and you just get to shoot stuff, and that's okay. Yeah, it's yeah. like those classic arcades where you hold up the guns, but within yeah. your own home and virtual reality. Like, you think of Doom, which was the other big VR game they had, that sort of works because it's a traditional FPS, you're very in the action, it's, you know, it's not precision aiming sort of thing, it is a lot more just kind of, ah, take out the demons, ah! Yeah, but and Fallout also they... Fallout 4 is an RPG sort of thing, it doesn't really work as well in my opinion. And they... If they're employing different movement systems in Fallout 4 VR and the um, Doom VR experience because in Doom they've actually implemented a teleportation movement system which is what a lot of games are doing to get around the whole motion sickness idea which a lot of people experience when using VR in a very kind of movement based game such as you know FPS games such as Doom mm. 
So Dooms VR, I think, is the more, you know, the better thought out one compared to Fallout 4's VR, where it's, you know, you actually have to kind of imitate the movement, which, as mentioned, can cause people to be motion sick. And just frankly looks really it, stupid. Yeah. I'm sorry, Bethesda. I really feel like we've been very negative about your conference, <laughs> but I really come on. I, like, I I normally like their games. It's just I like their year. games. It's just <laughs> this wasn't a great E3 for Bethesda. They're a great company. They create great games. I mean, Skyrim, as we've said, it's been around for yeah. six years. It's still going. People clearly love it. They love your other games. Just yeah, not the greatest one. Okay, moving on to PC releases and uh, announcements. Probably one of the more interesting games I've seen from the PC panel this year was Fortnite, which is, I do believe, Epic Games' um, sort of introduction into the sort of, I want to call it wave-based survival genre, but that would be a complete lie because, you know, Epic are known for their Gears of War horde mode, of course, so... Um, Fortnite, if you don't know, is a sort of cartoony art style, wave-based, fort-based, you know, survival game where you build a fort and then you go out during the day, find supplies to further enhance your fort with goody traps and, you know, just all the fun things you would expect to be able to do to your fort in a zombie apocalypse. And then during the night, you get attacked by waves of, you know, different types of zombies. Very um, understandable if you've played really any recent FPS in the last few years. As of course, lots of games are using wave-based, you know, survival sub-modes in their games just to flesh them out a bit and add a bit more content and replayability. And this this game, Fortnite, has gone all in on that principle. Um, from what I know, there are different classes to play. There's a there's one focused on building better than the other, you know, classes. There's a ninja class. There's a soldier class. There's a I do believe, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a class that specializes in searching out resources um, on the map. So, yeah, it looks really cool. Um, what, what are your thoughts, Salmon? I think that and the first time I saw it, I kind of thought, this is ambitious. Um, because, I mean, the trailer does make it out to look. It looks like an incredible game where you're, as you say, it is focused on building forts, like trap systems to take out all these crazy monsters. And it looks like a lot of fun. It looks like if they've got the multiplayer right, so that you can straight up, you know, get with your friends, uh, get into a massive world and build incredible creations, it looks like it could be a lot of fun. Potentially with, you know, a decent amount of replayability. It all depends, in my opinion, on whether they get the multiplayer right. I mean, we can't really speak to that so much because it's so early in the game's uh, kind of release uh, in terms of knowledge about it. But yeah, I think that's the most yeah. important thing. Yeah, if if they can nail the functionality and ensure that multiplayer is just quick and easy to get into a game, either with randoms across the internet or with your friends, as long as that all works out, I, you know, the game looks cool at its core. The ideas are there. And if you think about it, it's essentially the classic formula of enemies come at night and you've got to defend against them. It's essentially Minecraft um, day-night cycle compressed with a more structured kind of defense system, mm. which is, you know, it's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. So another game that I'm particularly looking forward to because I think it holds a, a really special place within gaming is Age of Empires Definitive Edition, uh, which is coming out to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the original Age of Empires. Now, when Age of Empires came out, it, oh, it defined a genre within strategy gaming. The, the kind of building a base with your workers, you know, having to go into certain units to defeat your opponent's units. It, it set out so many almost cliches that are now used uh, in gaming. Like, if you look at Dawn of War 3... It has a lot of similarities to Age of Empires because of the, you know, gaining resources, um, building units, uh, building vehicles to take out uh, certain types of infantry, uh, you know, just taking out a, opponents, unit building buildings. There's so many, it's so 
pervasive in what elements have you gone from Age of Empires into other games like Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds which was essentially just a Star Wars version of Age, um, Age of Empires uh, Dawn of the Modern Worlds which enhanced the graphics changed some of the gameplay literally you could go on it was a huge game that probably hasn't aged that well which is why you know new graphics the updated gameplay is, is so nice if you it's 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 the father of a lot of strategy gaming it's so good to have a release coming out that celebrates that yeah definitely and i'm just looking at the graphics right now and it it looks nice um i i'm actually quite excited to play what is such a forefather of the rts genre mm. um maybe not the first you know rts but definitely one of the forefathers and um yeah yeah seeing how it plays seeing the mechanics so i think um, and a lot of people of our age, kind of age range, who maybe didn't play the original game when it was, you know, the big cheese of the day. Well, I was four we when it first it. came out, so no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so definitely didn't experience it. But yeah, um, for us and younger people as well, it seems awesome. Definitely a cool prospect to try out. Yeah. So another game that I'm definitely looking forward to, it's not really a game, it's actually... An expansion uh, is Tyranny Bastard's Wound. I I love Tyranny. I think it's such a good game. Uh, it's an isometric uh, RPG game. You know, you control a custom designed character who then has lots of companions in a party based system. It's it's essentially what um, Dungeons and Dragons is on a computer game, and oh, it's so beautiful because it it takes that classic genre, you know, Baldur's Gate, uh, Icewind Vale, oh, yeah. um, Pillars of Eternity, the most recent one, and from the same producers, Obsidian and Paradox. It twists it and makes you the bad guy. And the fact that they're still developing it is brilliant. It's definitely something I'm going to play because I love Tyranny. And uh, like Pillars of Eternity, from the same producers, kind of the forerunner of Tyranny. Um, that's a brilliant game, uh, which they're bringing out the second one of not too in the future. They haven't really spoken about it because they've been focused on this. Um, also, shout outs to uh, in the same genre. If we're listing all the recent releases, Divinity Original Sin. Yeah, that's another one you should check out if you're interested. Um, yeah. Also, currently on Kickstarter, the makers of Pathfinder, Pezo, uh, Pathfinder being a tabletop RPG, they are currently bringing out their own game based on the Pathfinder system. So if you love Pathfinder, definitely check out Pathfinder Kingmaker, the um, isometric RPG, which I am really, really looking forward to, almost as much as this, I think. So another small thing that I'm looking forward to is uh, Battletech, which from what I've seen, it's based on the, the old board game, um, and it's essentially it's XCOM but with gigantic robots. So I just think that it looks essentially yeah. Yeah, it just looks like a fun game. Um, and it's turn-based strategy. Mm. Um, if you haven't played the genre before, dear listeners, then essentially you you're going to have to be thinking about where you want to move. Yeah. Um, your individual unit. It's a you're thinky probably, game. It's a very thinky game. Um, if you're after just all-out RTS action, it's not that. The R in RTS means real-time strategy. Um, I guess the RT stands for real-time strategy. <laughs> Shot myself. The, the RTS there, but... stands for real-time strategy. Now we've gotten somewhere. So um, this is just much slower paced. It's much. It's mm. basically a game of chess with massive robots. Is I think is the best way to. That describe is it. that is the perfect way to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. So if that sounds like your idea of a good time, get excited. Battletech. <laughs> okay, so moving on to Crytek's very own Hunt Showdown. So, this is a game that is exciting for two reasons. First off, it is um, made by Crytek, who made the Crisis series, and who actually started off um, the Far Cry series with the original Far Cry game on PC. And you might have heard of Crisis. The original game on PC was a monster to run. Um, I still occasionally just reinstall it and play it just to see if my latest computer kind of hardware can even run it well on max settings. 
And up to this day, the answer is still no, you know, you're an absolute technological scrub. So that makes me feel <laughs> terrible. But moving on very quickly, um, Hunt Showdown, the second reason it's so interesting. First off, it's going to look gorgeous, is the point of that previous tangent. But second off, it is of the same genre that many games we've covered so far um, have been. The very rapidly growing and emerging just sort of survival arena Hunger Games style of genre where people are basically dotted around a map, they're tasked with killing each other, and in this game there's also an extra objective where essentially each team, and I do believe it's a essentially multiple teams of two players, so um, practically you could just choose one partner, one of your friends, and then hop into a match. Each team of, of two is tasked with finding various clues dotted around the map, which eventually lead to a boss. This boss you can then kill, which will give you a, I do believe, a way to escape the mission, as in directions to a place to escape the mission, and from there, you need to escape and then you win. I might have gotten some of the details mixed up because it's very complex, <laughs> I've got to be honest. No, you're pretty much on it. But so regardless. You, you get these clues. You are in teams of two. You get these clues. You kill the... I think you have to kill three demons and each one gives you a clue as to where a portal is. Or once you've killed the three demons, the portal is just automatically open sort of thing. And that I think that is... sounds about right. That is a really interesting twist because like you say, it is an arena survival game like some of the other ones we've talked about, like um, the Darwin Project, etc. But this addition to the demon sort of thing, the hunting the demon, it adds an extra element in it to kind of muddle up the PvP survival aspect. But at the same time, it changes it from just standard PvP, you're in an arena, you kill people, to you're in an arena trying to complete an objective whilst trying not to be killed. Yeah, so it's, it's the idea that maybe one team is trying to find these clues and defeat the demons, but another team could choose just to track that team and follow them to, you know, the final objective. It's mm. it's really cool. Um, and it gives you another way of playing the game that, you know, if you don't want to fight the other players directly, if you're unsure with your, of your own, you know, FPS skill, you could just go for the player versus environment, the PvE aspect of this game. And it's, yeah, it's really cool. It's a nice adaptation on this rapidly growing new genre. Yeah, it's definitely something I think we're going to keep an eye on because, as you say, it's it's teams of two playing, and there are two of us. So yeah. we're definitely going to be keeping an eye on Crytek's Hunt Showdown with a view to play ourselves. So yeah, kind of watch this space and uh, keep an eye on it. Yeah. So one of the, I mean, we've mentioned a lot of the big E3 reveals. One of the biggest has to be Far Cry Five because. Yep. Holy dingo, it is going to be a big one, and damn, does it look good. Graphically outstanding. Um, just environment-wise, it looks so vivid and alive. I mean, Far Cry, you expect it from them. They, the You expect it from Ubisoft. They have created some absolute masterpieces, and it looks like they've done exactly the same thing with Far Cry 5, creating a game environment that you know is going to be a challenge, is going to be fun to run around in, uh, they've created. Oh, I oh you know I'm watching the trailer right now, and some guys just bash someone else's head in with a baseball bat. So that is what I look Lovely. for in video games. But yeah, <laughs> it it just you can have a dog friend. I just <laughs> I think that Far Cry Five is going to be huge. Yeah, um, I mean it, it's one of those franchises, right? It's it really kicked off with Far Cry Three. Personally, I adored Far Cry Two, but that was when it was quite a small series. Um, Far Cry Three, it really established the idea of climbing outposts, scanning an area, and, you know, getting all of your mission objectives, all the sub-objectives. Mm. And Far Cry 4, you know, it, it just continued that idea. And the games have looked gorgeous. Um, really, for the, the whole series has been known for just taking graphics to the next level. And it, you know, from the trailer, bearing in mind it is a trailer, so it might not be quite representative, but even so, it looks cool. And I think a lot of people will want to play it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a kind of franchise that hasn't shied away from doing a lot of things as well. I mean, look at Far, Far Cry Primal. So I'm looking forward to kind of what they introduce in this new game. So a game that I think definitely everyone is getting pretty hyped about must be Beyond Good and Evil 2. 
uh, rumoured to have been an absolute development hell. I mean, the rumours about it coming out started out in 2007, so that kind of shows how long this has kind of been languishing. That is ridiculous. The yes. fact that they finally yeah. officially announced it at E3 is amazing. Uh, it's set to be a prequel to uh, the original Beyond Good and Evil, which came out in 2003, so it shows it doubles down on how long it's been in development. Um, it, it, you know, it, the fact that it's going back to kind of being a traditional uh, CRPG uh, is, I think, a really good step. I, I love CRPGs. I think they're a lot more approachable than uh, systems that complicate it. But obviously, some systems that have complicated it have worked out excellently. I'm not saying it's not, but I think that um, I think it's just going to be. You know, you don't know too much about it, so I don't want to be too hyperbolic, but I think that considering how long it's been in development, it's either going to be excellent or broken up by different developers, different directors, stuff like that, and not as good as everyone hoped. But because of the hype, I hope it really works out for Ubisoft uh, with Beyond Good and Evil 2, because I, it's a game that's been hyped up. Hopefully it will fulfill that. Yeah, what we definitely do not want to see is another... What was it? The the last Duke Nukem game, which was a game that was passed between developers over many years, took ages to release, and when it did release, it was critically slammed for, you know, all the right reasons. It just was not a good game. But you know what? From what we're seeing in the trailer, Beyond Good and Evil 2, it looks cool. Um, And as someone who hasn't actually played the series I look I'm you know I'm interested which you know not every game makes you interested so that's a definitely a good sign so definitely something to look out for hopefully it turns out to be on the better end of the spectrum so earlier we talked about Sea of Thieves uh, the kind of pirate PvP um, that's kind of moving on to the kind of the the community and how we're, we're looking forward to getting getting into a bit of pirate action. Uh, now, Ubisoft have announced their own pirate PvP game, uh, Skull and Bones. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the same sort of thing as Sea of Thieves, but it's different enough to be unique. I mean, uh, Skull and Bones is more realistic in terms of graphics. It's a lot more, I would say, serious as a game whereas Sea of Thieves was a lot more oh let's go get some treasure oh this is fun let's go swing in with some sharks oh let's go drink some grog and play the harpsichord um, that is the best impression I think <laughs> I've ever heard of any pirate Skull, well and, Skull and Bones <laughs> is a lot more um, oh, this is how quickly the wind is moving in this direction you need to turn the sail this much uh, oh, you need to capture the enemy's ship, uh, not by shooting yourself out of a cannon, but by getting really close to it with some yeah. clever sailing. So it's—I uh, don't think you want to, you want to call it a you know a pirate simulation game. It's but it's definitely more kind of precise in how it's depicting it. I guess mm. is the best way to describe it. I mean, similar to what we were talking about with um, the. The consoles, the big consoles, you know, Sony and Microsoft, them going in different directions, one choosing VR, one choosing graphical fidelity, um, with Sea of Thieves and Skull and Bones going in different directions, again, that's only a good thing for players. If you want, you know, a slightly more, I don't want to call it casual, because it, you know, it's still a pirate's game. Um, if, you want, if you want the more cartoony gra art style, you know, to take an example, I guess, You'll probably want to go with Sea of Thieves if you want something slightly more detailed in terms of the art style, Skull and Bones. And it's the same principle, you know, you just get more choice. And let's be honest, it's not like we're drowning in pirate games lately. So no, that is true. I'm super, yeah, it's just cool. Really cool. Okay, so next up we've got Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. This, I think, when it was announced, surprised everyone on the floor, both there and watching the stream, as it was such a strange title to A, announce, and, you know, you don't expect Mario and Rabbids to kind of collab in any game. Um, also, B, the genre that they went in for this. Essentially, it's XCOM using the Mario and Rabbids um, I guess characters. It's weird. 
essentially you'll be hiding behind cover, um, shooting up other evil rabbits, maybe? It's weird. It's, yeah. In one word, it is just weird. It, lo <laughs> it looks like, um, you know, it's got the childish graphics of the Mario universe. Um mixed with a, as you say the weird kind of gameplay that you'd associate with XCOM it is yeah an unusual combination I mean I'm looking at Princess Peach right now holding what looks like a laser gun yeah and Luigi holding a hoover I I tell you what and a rabbit I I do like the rabbits dressed up as different traditional Mario characters. Like you've got the Yoshi one, you've got a Luigi one, you've got a Princess Peach one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've just seen I'm, a gigantic you know Donkey Kong rabbit. Oh no, really? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm just glad that this exists because it's so out there, it's so wacky, and it's it's cool. And you know what? To be fair, on a more serious note, it's going to introduce this particular genre, which was typically taken up by XCOM and more serious kind of franchises and IPs, um, and introduce it to, you know, all the fans of Mario. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, even though we don't quite know what to make of it, I think overall this is going to turn out to be a pretty cool thing. Okay, another one of the big releases that they announced must be Assassin's Creed Origins. Taking the game, possibly, I, I think it's definitely what they're hinting at it anyways, back to the roots of the Assassins uh, in ancient Egypt. I personally, I really like ancient Egyptian history. I, you know, I studied it at school, stuff like that. Um, so I, same, same. I really like this as a setting for an Assassin's Creed game. Um, and as long as it keeps the kind of core gameplay i can't see why this won't be another really good game um one thing i did notice that i thought was weird in the um the e3 gameplay trailer it's like a standard assassin's creed game you know it's very historical with the, the kind of slightly weird sci-fi undercurrent it has uh, and then just towards the end of the trailer you just see the assassin fighting a giant snake and it's like oh I, uh, okay. I see the snake. Yeah, that's. I mean, I weird. I have a fear of snakes, so it might just be that I particularly didn't enjoy that part. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, probably not. So yeah. I, I'm just wondering, um, kind of where. Looks cool. Yeah, it does look very cool. I'm just kind of wondering where this Assassin's Creed game is going. Is it going to be? You know, you know what this makes me want. Mm -hmm. I don't. I'd, I'm. I'm fine with this existing because. Essentially, Assassin's Creed at this point has just become an excuse for <laughs> Ubisoft to just go back to cool time periods and locations hmm. and just explore them within the overarching theme of, ooh, Assassins. Um, but what I would love is just a game where it's not Assassin's Creed, it's not a pre-existing franchise, but it's in ancient Egypt for some reason. That would be cool. That would be. But um, This is yeah, what we're stuck this with game for now. In particular. But, uh, no. I don't think it's a bad thing to be stuck um, with. No, it's cool. I'm glad not, not many games go to ancient Egypt. It's a really cool kind of time, location, uh, culture to explore in game form. It's super interesting, you know, the focus on life after death and death itself. And, you know, the architecture, obviously the Sphinx, the pyramids. It's so evocative. Um, who doesn't love that stuff? I mean, really? Yeah, I think this is super cool. So a game that got quite a lot of hype was one of the games from the Sony conference, uh, Marvel's Spider-Man. Now, we're all loving the fact that Spider-Man is now in the kind of Marvel Cinematic Universe. The fact that they're bringing out a new Spider-Man game, I think it's got a lot of fans, as I said, pretty hyped. Uh, it, from what we've seen, it reminds me of kind of the traditional and well-loved Spider-Man games from kind of the PS2 era. Swinging around buildings, wide open area and then they've kind of added in PlayStation 4 graphics and it does look like a beautiful game actually uh, and it is I mean you could probably say that about most games now with 4k resolution but it looks it looks wonderful yeah definitely um, like you say the one of the big appeals for um, one of the big kind of draw factors for spider-man games is that 
as Spider-Man, you fully expect and therefore are allowed to just swing through a city um, and just sort of just live the life of a super acrobat, super acrobatic superhero um, as Spider-Man is. And from the gameplay that we saw from the trailer, it was a rather long trailer actually. Um, you can do that. So I think, yeah, that is one of the main reasons why people are getting quite excited. Yeah, um, I particularly like the fact that they've used uh, a, a combat star similar to that scene in, you know, the Arkham series, um, and to uh, some extent Shadow of Mordor, that kind of butting mashing to get yeah. combos. I think that's, I think that really w works really well with superhero games. So hopefully they've learned a lot of the lessons from previous failures, and as well they've learned some of the lessons from the successes of previous Spider-Man games. So we'll end up with just a brilliant, a brilliant game. So uh, uh, yet another big game that they're talking about is the brand new God of War. And yeah, so essentially they're taking Kratos from the, the classical, mysterious world of Greek gods, the kind of the petty human nature of those gods, and they're transporting him complete with brand new child, forget old child, that original trilogy was about him making up for, uh, you know, his death. Brand new child, brand new wife. Uh, wife maybe not in it that much. Uh, but now he's in He's in Norway. He's in the Norse lands. Maybe not Norway. I mean, Vikings Lovely. in Norse do go <laughs> further than Norway, but... Um, yeah, that's literally what this looks like it's going to be. They're taking a chance to um, soft reboot the... The series, mm. I guess I would call it, um, taking it to somewhere completely new, somewhere he's going to be unfamiliar. Um, in the trailer, he's fighting what looks like a sea serpent, you know, like a sea dragon, something like that. And that's super cool. Like, essentially, you're going to have the chance to fight things that, under the theme of ancient Greece, um, he otherwise wouldn't have been able to fight. And let's face it, at this point, there probably aren't any remaining surviving <laughs> Greek gods that slash goddesses slash demigods to uh, provide him with any, I don't know, any interaction of any kind. Yep. So, yeah. Naked or um, bloody. <laughs> or perhaps both. Indeed, it's both, Kratos. Both Either way, he will take both of those, and now he will take them from the Norse gods. Yep. So. Uh, I'd hate Should to see how... Time. Uh, Tom Hiddleston and uh, Chris Hemsworth are gonna do with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So traditional around this time of year, they have finally un unveiled officially details and footage of the new Call of Duty. And yep, as expected. So much hype for me personally. I I personally, I, you know, I grew up playing the Call of Duty games. You know, the first COD I had was. World at War. I came to it a little bit late, I'd say. Uh, I had World of War, um, one of the best Call of Duties in my opinion. Then they followed that up with Modern Warfare 2, which probably is the best Call of Duty they've ever made. Uh, um, they had such good. I ones. would contest that. Oh, that. Oh, you, you'd that. say the original Modern Warfare, Modern Warfare 1. You? That again. I loved the Modern Warfare. I haven't played oh. that too much. I know that's a really popular one, so I will concede that that is an arguable point. I. Yeah. But. Thank you. I think what you can't argue with is that, well, you probably can, but in my opinion, they've gone downhill in recent iterations. They've gone too much into overcomplicating the gameplay, you know, adding in wall running, double jumping, going into space. It's like, is this really a Call of Duty game anymore? So the fact that they've... I mean, they've widened the definition of Call of Duty so much that I think they could go into the Viking era yeah. and call it Call of Duty, I mean, and people wouldn't raise their eyebrows. Well, I think people would raise their eyebrows. I just think they'd still <laughs> buy it. Um, yeah, true, true. But what I'm really happy with is that they're going back to World War II. Um, World War II was where Call of Duty started. As I said, World of War, it was my first... That's COD Five. World of War uh, was my first Call of Duty, so it's like going back to its roots for me. Um, and oh, I'm actually excited for it. I'm actually thinking, yes, I'm going to buy Call of Duty again. And the gameplay looks like it's gone back to that brilliant era where it was, it was competitive, but it wasn't overly complicated. That era of uh, Modern Warfare 1, World at War, Modern Warfare 2, Black Ops 1, where it was just brilliant multiplayer that everyone could get their hands on and could enjoy. Yeah, um... I mean, you were definitely a big Call of Duty player in your past, and whilst I haven't played any recent Call of Duties, 
I'm, you know, I don't have anything personally against against the genre, against not the genre, against the series. It's just, you know, recent titles don't look that interesting. But this one, back to World War Two. Um, the fact that it's back to World War Two kind of restricts all the crazy mechanics that they can get away with because, you know, they didn't have jetpacks in World War Two, so <laughs> chances are they won't be using those. Or so, did um, they? Yeah, I... Dun, dun, dun. A new secret experimental zone. Oh, we've, um, we've yeah, just laid out what the new Call of Duty plot is going to be. <laughs> we found it. We found it. Nazis have jetpacks. Um, we must stop them. <laughs> Zombie jetpacks? Oh, dun, dun, dun. I hope they have a new Nombies in it. I think they've already mentioned that they are going to. That's something that is in my brain for some reason. But, oh, it's going to be good. Maybe. Maybe going to be good. Ah. Nah, I'm, Let's leave it at that, I'm all aboard the hype train. <laughs> so we mentioned uh, earlier when we were talking about Anthem that Destiny is getting a sequel. Um, essentially, from what I can tell from the trailer, it is a, it is pretty much just Destiny, but with better graphics and updated weapons and stuff like that. So I'm hoping it's going to be a, uh, all but a game where they've learned the lessons from Destiny 1 and are now ready to make a, a hopefully flawless loot exploration FPS game. I mean, Destiny 1, huge, really good game. Now's the time to step up, don't make the same mistakes that it had at launch for the first game, and really push back against Anthem's big rise. It doesn't look like they've changed yeah, too much, because... so... Yeah, I mean, I guess... We won't know until it releases, but um, just the fact that Anthem exists hopefully inspires Bungie to, you know, push their particular boat out a bit further, do a better job than last time, and, you know. Um, yeah, if you like the original Destiny, then as you would expect, Destiny 2 is probably going to be your thing. If not, then, you know, move on. So a game that I'm particularly excited for uh, is Monster Hunter World. I was a huge fan of Monster Hunter games when I was kind of getting into gaming. I had um, Monster Hunter Freedom on PlayStation Portable, then I got Monster Hunter Freedom 2, and then the kind of expansion Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. I oh, I must have sunk thousands of hours into those, mon those games. I got to a really high level, then my game corrupted and I stopped playing. Uh, oh, so sad. sad. Um, and then, kind of, what happened was that Monster Hunter went to Nintendo. So they had the they had the next couple of iterations on the Wii uh, and the Wii U, and then they kind of switched over to DS. And I have played the Wii versions, and I've played the DS versions, and I, it wasn't the same. I I don't know what it was, but it was. I always thought it was a better game on kind of the PlayStation Portable. With Monster Hunter World, it's coming back to PlayStation, which I think is a really good thing. And they're, they're I mean, they're bringing it out on computer as well. So, are they really? Yeah, they are. So it, it's coming out on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Windows, which I think shows that this isn't going to be the same Monster Hunter they've had the last few iterations where it's been on DS. It's going to be a bigger game. I mean, they're already promising much larger maps, a four-player online co-op. Um, which was what it was like back on the PlayStation um, PlayStation Portable where you could ad hoc it or online. A huge thing I personally think is the fact that they're no longer splitting Japanese players from Western players. So that means that there will be more players Ooh. to hunt with. I, it is the bigger maps that I personally am looking forward to because sometimes the zones can feel quite small. Getting out there, no loading screens between the zones makes it a lot more freer. It looks like yeah. they have learnt the mistakes of the last few Monster Hunters, in my opinion, and have created what all Monster Hunter fans want in a game, really. I am I am hyped for this game. Uh, it's probably not a game that everyone will be looking forward to, um, but for me personally, as a previous Monster Hunter fan, uh, as a fan of this kind of game, I'm looking forward to it. And I would definitely encourage people to check out the Monster Hunter games. They are a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I do believe I played Monster Hunter 2 back in the day, and my overriding memory was running away from the really big monster and um, cooking meat on a fire and repeatedly burning it. 
Um, but that was fun. That was a really fun to the younger version of me. So did you play uh, it? It's a really cool series. Did you play it up until you got uh, cat companions that followed you out? Felines. I did not. I ah, didn't that, that was one of the best additions in the game. Previously, they were just like ah. they were just your chefs and stuff, and all of a sudden, you could have one in armor that came out with you and was like your your buddy. I would help you that fight sounds the monsters. So cute. They had better have it. If, they've pretty much yeah. had it in the last few ones, so they better have it in this one as well, because that was so good. Oh, they will. That that sounds too cute not to include. Mm. So um if you're into <laughs> sending uh very heavily armored cats into battle and um carving up the bodies of your fallen foes into better gear, then Monster Hunter World, ladies and gentlemen. All aboard the hype soon. train. Hi pipe. Okay, so then, moving on to the Nintendo conference, and the probably the most interesting announcement that they gave, although, as you will soon find out, possibly not the most hyped, um, <laughs> Super Mario Odyssey. This was a bit of a weird one for people watching the trailer at the event, because just watching the trailer, you, you might be leaving quite confused from that particular conference, but turns out... We've got some more details now, so here we go. Essentially, you can go around um, a very open map, and as you go between, I, I guess, realms, the art style changes, and running through this is the theme that you can use this character hat and possess people using this hat by throwing it on them, become them, and I guess gain particular abilities uh, specific to them. And from there, I guess you just do whatever the hat compels you to, because, <laughs> let's face it, that hat is probably going to be the most evil son of a gun you've ever met. Obey but, the hat. Yeah. <laughs> Obey the it's hat. Like, it's like the Hypnotoad <laughs> from Futurama. Oh, don't remind All me. All hail the I hat. Years. No. Um, yeah, do you have any ideas on this one? Um, yeah, it's following on a lot of the kind of 3D gameplay they've had in, in previous Mario games, but the... I mean, the fact that you can now throw your hat and possess other characters, the enemies, is an interesting one. Uh, it's something that could be a game changer for the Mario kind of games in terms of gameplay mechanics. Um, but it's you know it's the same with most sequels. As long as they keep what was good about previous games, they'll be fine. Um, yeah, the hat dominated it, didn't it? Really, the hat. I mean, that that bit where it takes over it really a T Rex. Did. Yeah. That was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. And I'd, I, I'm i trying to watch the trailer and see if he sprouts a mustache, the T-Rex, but I can't quite see it. I'm not sure. Pretty, but, much, um... pretty much everybody else does. Like, even the tank uh, yep. shoots a mustache. I like, um, bullet. Oh, he does! He does have a mustache. You can just about see it. The T-Rex? The T-Rex really? does just about have a mustache. Oh, that's cool. Okay. <laughs> Get hyped, everyone, then. T-Rex is all we needed. We people. just needed confirmation. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, you kind of go through different um, art-styled realms. So there's like a very realistic realm. There's sort of like a, a monochrome realm. Um, and it, yeah, you know, lots of platforming, as you would expect from Mario. Kind of unlocking things, figuring out puzzles, etc. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's definitely a change of the formula. But for a series as, you know, as old and I guess one might say quite rigid in terms of how it plays out most of the time as Mario, maybe that's not a bad thing. Another game that I think a lot of people are hyped for but actually there isn't very much known about it yet is Metroid Prime 4. I mean they just they throw up that Starscape they throw up that big number 4 the title of the game and they just left us hungry for more. But the fact that Yes, Metroid 4, Metroid Prime 4 is in development for Nintendo Switch is big news. It's exciting news. Definitely. It's a classic um, series, and even though we've got no specific details, I think just the fact that this has been confirmed will be enough for many, many people. Okay, so at the beginning of this video, we did promise that we were going to reveal our picks at the conference. Essentially, we're just going to take one announcement that each of us thinks was, to us personally, the biggest announcement. Uh, and Slippers, why don't you throw your hat into the ring first? Okay, well, this is going to be a bit of a last minute adjustment. I originally, um, I originally was planning to make my pick of the, of the whole event 
to be Anthem for many, many reasons. Um, but last minute, I am going to change to Hunt Showdown. Ooh. So, um, I hopefully we can get some gameplay showing in the background, but this game looks so cool for so many reasons. Um, as mentioned when we talked about it, it's once again expanding this very new genre, um, survival arena, you know, everyone fights to try and survive, and it has so much potential, and graphically it looks awesome. Crytek are known for having, you know, punishing games when it comes to just the graphical kind of requirements. Um, and if you do watch the gameplay, look at how dark the shadows look. And just that, coupled with clearly how how clean the lighting is, I think it's going to be a great game. And I'm personally, the more I watch gameplay of it, the more I get excited for it. So um, hopefully they can pull it off and do it justice. Yeah, definitely. It's... It, uh, a hunt showdown is a game I'm excited for as well. I mean, the potential that we could, you know, get involved in it, playing it, means that I, it's something I'm going to keep an eye on for. And as you say, the the kind of arena PvP, it's a growing genre, and but this one takes it and has a little bit of a twist on it. So I think, yeah, yeah. it's a good pick. Yeah. Definitely a good pick. So, your choice. It all boils down to you. Yeah, well, I what mean... You I mean, you're right in what you were initially thinking, the Anthem... Anthem is going to be huge, I think. But that's not my pick. There's so many things that I'm really hyped for. I mean, Monster Hunter World, I'd really like to have made that my pick. Um, because it's it means yeah. a lot to me. That they're bringing Pokemon on the Switch. I mean, very little announced about that. Just a kind of passing, oh, we're going to be making Pokemon for the Switch. That grabbed me and I was like, oh, Pokemon on the Switch. <laughs> it's going to be a few years away, but oh, I'd really like to make that my pick. But I think... I think I have to go for my pick being Star Wars Battlefront 2. I think that Ooh, okay. the first game, that, you know, there were problems, but it was a brilliant game. And from what they've shown so far, it looks like they fixed pretty much all the problems that gamers had with Star Wars Battlefront 1. If they can conjure up that nostalgia that, came, that kind of surrounds the original PlayStation 2 Star Wars Battlefront. If they can make pretty much a copy of that, but with new graphics, new ideas, they could really have a game, like a world-breaking game that could really just dominate for, you know, years. It has all the materials there. And it, you know, it looks beautiful. I mean, as a Star Wars fan, yeah. getting Darth Maul and just running around again. Ah, oh, it, like the same reason that Monster Hunter World in, uh, invokes a lot of childhood. Star Wars Battlefront does the exact same. It was a game that I sunk hundreds of hours into, and if they can make a game half as good, I'll, I'll sink another few hundred hours into it. Yeah, I'm definitely hyped for it. I'm I'm just hoping that they do a better job than they did um, starting off with the first game. Uh, but as you say, the pieces seem to be much better this time around. It's just a question of whether they can assemble them the right way. And you know, it's not like we get a lot of Star Wars games either. I've said that I've said that about a lot of the games we've covered. Like, there's not many pirate games around um, from the last few years. There's not a, a lot of um, you know, ancient Egypt games around, hence Assassin's Creed Origins mm. getting exciting. Um, the same is definitely true with any Star Wars game release. I mean, other than the previous Battlefront, there haven't really been any. The previous series of Star Wars that we had was, what was it? It was Force Unleashed, I believe. Am I mistaken? I mean, I can't really think of anything else. It does feel like since yeah. Disney took over that there has been a kind of dearth of Star Wars games. I mean, previously they had a lot in development that got cancelled. They had that 13, 14, something like that, the, the Bounty Hunter game that got cancelled. Um, and they yeah. haven't really picked up anything overtly new. So hopefully, if Star Wars Battlefront 2 does kick on as we all hope it does, maybe this will lead to a new, a new set of Star Wars games coming out. Uh, you know, new stories, new, new worlds, new characters. Yeah, just a, a lot of new games. That's what Star Wars fans want. We want good games. And there are the blueprints for them. Yeah. You just need to pick them up and do them. Don't get don't get arrogant about the game you're making. I almost think that's what happened with Star Wars Battlefront. They were like, 
we're making a Battlefront yeah. game, we've got these ideas, what we think is what is right and what we think is what's going to happen. It doesn't matter what you, the community, want because this is the game we're making. And now they have stepped back and gone, we've made mistakes. That's all you have to do. Just listen to the community. The, it, the blueprints are out there. The feedback is out there. People know what they want from a Star Wars game. You just have to listen. And hopefully this will kick that on. So I, my, my pick for Star Wars Bond isn't just because I think it's going to be a really good game. It's because I'm hoping it will lead to further really good games. Yeah, indeed. Um, there's definitely a very passionate Star Wars uh, gaming community out there. They're sadly, you know, not being fulfilled with that Star Wars gaming nuss uh, to quite the extent that they want and therefore if you can li listen to their pas passion and uh, what they want really from a game you can definitely get a lot of positive feedback which the first game sadly did not get so yeah really yeah. cool pick really cool pick thank you well this has been Solemn Salmon um, with the wonderful guest that is Slippers Talking about E3, giving you an overview of the games that have been announced, what we think are kind of the picks of E3. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe for more. Make sure to check out Slippers. There's a, a link to his channel in the description. And I'll, I'll see you next time.